Good morning, and welcome to The Review, the Instagram Live podcast where Kandama news, culture, and stories are shared over the warmth of coffee. Today, we are incredibly excited to welcome to The Review, Kandama legend, risk taker, Kandama pioneer, and the founder of Sweets Kandamas, Matt Sweets Jorgensen. This is an incredible privilege to host this conversation as Matt is one of the pioneers that really brought Kendama to life in North America. This is quite a privilege for us to dive into this story together with you guys over this cup of coffee and I am thrilled. I hope you guys are just as excited as I am. It's going to be a fun one here this morning. So make sure you grab your beverage of choice, whether that's coffee, water, tea, I'll let it go this time and we will dive into this week's review. A couple things I want to remind you guys of is that we launched the brand new Cafe Kendama website and you can get yourself one of these Kendama latte mugs on there. We're shipping to Canada and to the States, so you can pick one of those up as well as we got some other goodies up there like coffee brewing guides, you can join the Discord and the Patreon and all that good stuff. But today we are going to cut right to the chase and dive in, but not without asking our faithful listeners every week, what are you drinking this morning? I want to know down in the chat what you are drinking. So drop a comment down below, let me know what you got, and we'll shout out a few of our community members here this morning. You know me, I got my coffee. I did make some Chemex this morning, and if you aren't familiar with Chemex, head over to my story, I walked through the entire process for you, uh, but I did go and make an AeroPress right away because I only had about 10 minutes before this episode, and AeroPress is quite quick to make. I see Sweets Kanamas down in the chat, welcome here guys, glad you're here. Owen, he's drinking nothing. We got Chan the man drinking his raspberry cream Shasta, sipping on that god tier blue Gatorade this morning from Deep Hats. We got Funky Hef with the bean water. We got Sweets Kandamas with the G Fuel dry scoops. Shout out to Sweets Kandamas for always pumping the G Fuel. Guys, we're going to get you guys sponsored. Don't you even worry. We know that Zimbu is drinking that nitro cold brew. We like that. And Kandama dines with the tea from Starbucks. Hey, you know what? You are still welcome here. Cody Booth, Magic Dama dude, drinking coffee as usual. Congratulations on your new job at Sweets Kandamas and Prosper Above. Brewing a cup right now in session. Nard with the AeroPress. We got Heavy Rips with the Chai Tea and Katana with the Nespresso. Guys, wonderful. This is amazing. We have a lively group this morning. I'm on my second cup. We're going to dive into a really wonderful conversation here with Matt. Journeying through his story as a Kandama player, as a business owner, and the trajectory that Kandama has gone on in the past 12, 10 years, the past decade of Kandama growing in North America, so much of that because of Sweets Kandamas and the work that Matt has done. He has an incredible perspective on this, and we want to dive into that. So a couple things I want to remind you guys of. One, interact. We have two incredible ways for you to interact in today's show. You can leave comments, let us know you're here, interact with the other live viewers, drop those hearts if you hear something you really like. Secondly, we have time set aside for your questions. There's a couple ways to get in on this. One is if you're a Patreon, I ask questions on our close friend stories and make sure that you guys get priority questions. Secondly, you can put questions down on the grid post on my page for the episode. And those are usually the second uh, most, most answered questions. And then thirdly, if we have time still, we'll answer some of your questions from the chat if you put them in the question box. If you just put them in the chat, we're going to miss them. So make sure you pop those in there. But all that to say, let's get Matt on here. Would you join me? It's a warm welcome to the preview. I see, see all, all those hearts. Matt, welcome what up? here. How's it going, Dude, man? It is going fantastic. This is the first time we've had a, an interview where I actually get to see you this time. <laughs> Dude, yeah, it's awesome, man. It's and you're, very cool. You're rocking the stash. Oh, my goodness. You know, like... Uh, how, do I, how do I get one of those? I've been, I've been trying for months. Oh, you got a good one, man. You got a nice, know. like, it makes <laughs> you look very proper. Yours is. Mine's a little bushy at this point. Um, Mrs. Sweets is a big fan, so I've been keeping her around to make her happy, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, right on, right on. Hey, where are you at right now? Uh, so I'm in the the Sweets Man Cave. This is where I do all my streaming from. Um, the Dama Wall is right here next to me. Oh, yeah. 
which might even be a little bit of a better better look. Um, yeah, look at that. Oh I'm, I'm usually, my setup's all for my webcams and stuff. So like the iPhone is like, I tried to get it straight, and stuff, <laughs> but it's like a I, little crook. So. You have no idea. Every morning I sit here with my tripod for like probably about five minutes, just tilting it slightly <laughs> this way, maybe putting a piece of paper under one. I try to get it as straight as I can, catching a little bit of the damas here, maybe a little bit of the plants there. It's a whole procedure. Yeah, yeah. Cody's like wants to rip his hair out watching me do this right now because he hates it when it's not perfectly framed. But you know what? I think that's going to work. Right on. Well, Matt, welcome to the review. I know that yeah. this has been a highly anticipated episode from our Patreon uh, listeners that have been, they, they know ahead of time what episodes are coming. So they've been really excited. Mm. And the people that found out this week, we had tons of messages come in with questions for you. Cool. Uh, and I think ultimately that comes down to you have held an incredible posture in the Kendama community as someone who has innovated, pioneered, and really pushed Kendama specifically in North America, but even globally. And, and I think a lot of us want to hear some of that story. But before we do, I always like to keep it a little light and ask a few, few warm up questions, you know, get, get, great, the, yeah. get the coffee flowing in our body. And so mm -hmm. with that, the first question I always want to ask is what are you drinking? Sure, sure. So I came prepared. That's most definite. So um, I'm a coffee drinker. The only difference is, is I drank my coffee like four or five hours ago, my first <laughs> cup, you know, like I get up six, seven o'clock most days with Miss Emma Jean hanging out. And so I'm brewing uh, French press first thing in the morning, you know, so I've got a little bit of extra coffee from this morning that I'm, uh, I'm sipping on now. But also, I had to make a little OJ. Uh, oh, yeah like with a little uh, tangerine LaCroix. So a little sparkling Ooh. orange juice this morning. So I should go just, do that. I have some orange juice and I have the, the grapefruit LaCroix downstairs. The grapefruit's Ooh, nice. the best. Dude, it's just a nice little pick me up after all the coffee, you know? And I have like, I got to shout out my local coffee roaster. Yes. I put it on the, on my story, but it's up coffee roasters and they roast all their own beans right in Minneapolis, like eight blocks from the shop. And this one was actually uh, to help uh, all the proceeds go to North Minneapolis and help uh, the kids in that area and get them the things they need because it's uh, one of the tougher parts of Minneapolis. So it's cool to that uh, the money from the beans is going to those people. So that's cool. That is awesome. I'm drinking a cup of coffee, but I also wanted to show this off. You know, you you, you got a wonderful distributor here in Canada, Bray. Yeah. Uh, Braden Joyce. He, he sent me a, a little gift just and it just arrived this week and and this is Dang. what i got from him i got this oh, sweet kendamas nice. uh like pint glass and so i filled it up with water because it's a little too early in the morning <laughs> for anything else but but i figured I, I needed some water to go with my coffee and i thought you you'd much appreciate it dude when he made those i was jealous there's no doubt about it i thought they were very cool i thought yeah. they were very cool very, very cool. Okay, cool. Well, Matt, let's, uh, let's hit two more questions here. And then we're really going to dive into this story. Uh, what sure. I want to know, and this has been a fun question we've been asking all of our guests this season on the review is, if you could teach any one person their first spike, past or present, who would it be? Holy cats. Holy cats. Past or present, who would it be? Live or dead? Doesn't matter. Yeah. Someone who already plays, you know, just to have the clout of being like, I taught Christian Frazier his first spike, you know, whatever it is. Oh, <laughs> see, I went straight to like famous people for some reason. Like I was initially like, oh, who would be like the funniest dude, you know, like Jim Carrey would be a cool dude mm. to meet and teach him just because I've watched all his movies. I grew up with him and he's super funny and goofy. So I feel like he wouldn't be like, oh, what's that thing? Like he'd be like, let me try. What's that yeah. about? Like, yeah. I've been I've taught Steve-O how to spike before. So that oh, was like a cool experience to be able to like do that with a cool, funny dude. So I think maybe Jim Carrey, Will Ferrell would be funny to do. Just someone who's like going to have fun with it. Right. I think that would be my yeah. favorite. Oh, that's cool. And you've probably, in all honesty, like asking you that question, you've actually probably taught a lot of, you know, famous individuals their first spike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back in like 2015 or something, me and Willie P and me and Narks, we got roped into going to these LA gifting suites and gifting shows where like yeah. C, D list celebrities come to get gifts before they go to the Nickelodeon Choice Awards or to wherever they were going. And so we're in this warehouse with our booth. And famous people are just coming by our booth that like you, some you know, some you don't. The most famous dude was uh, Manny from Modern Family. That oh, was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, me and Norks taught that dude how to play. And that dude. was like the oh, highlight so cool. of the famous people we met, right? Like 
which was which was cool. And there's a bunch of other people that if I was younger, I'm sure I would know, you know, a bunch of Disney stars and yeah. stuff. And oh, some wow. of them actually got stoked on it and got into it. And it's just like another one of those weird things that <laughs> we did just because it like kind of came about and we're like, oh, let's give it a shot, you know? Yeah, wow. Well, I, I saw down in the chat here uh, real quick, there were a couple guys shouting out, there's a Quebecois guy here in Canada called Jacob Acrobat, and I'm pretty sure he was part yeah. of Cirque du Soleil. Dude, we need to get that guy, Kandama. He does the craziest stuff with like knives and grapes and doing Ken flips and stuff. It's like, dude, the guy could do anything on a Kandama. <laughs> yeah, one of our best Instagram posts from last year was our repost of him. We, we connected with him early last year. I found him on Insta and uh, he only had 30,000 followers when we first reposted him. Oh, and wow. now he's at 330,000. Like, yeah. he's gotten just, he's gone so viral. His stuff is so sick. Like, yeah. now well, he's doing I, the P stuff with the, yeah. the P oh, and the spike. And that's, like, blowing people's minds. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, we, we need to get him some damas. Um, okay, yeah. la last question I want to know. And maybe this one's going to be a really difficult one for you since you've been so involved in Kandama for so long. But... Uh, who is the most inspiring player for you today? Not of all time, but more more recently. Who inspires um, you? Uh, I think my my in my gut reaction to that question is Ben Harold, just because mm. when I watched his video at NACO, I felt like like I didn't know that was coming, and when I saw it, I wasn't ready for like what he was about to do to Kendama, and I feel like that day he changed Kendama, modern Kendama, you know? Uh, mm. And that has only been built upon by other people who now do even crazier stuff, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that like, between him and the young guns trying to do 30 tap against one another and push those other aspects of Kendama, I really like look up to Ben Harold as a person who like only wants to create tricks and only wants to make content that's mm -hmm. inspiring and like, I think it's very cool, you know, like I, I, yeah, Ben Harold, I think is my answer. Ben Harold, every pro's favorite pro. Yeah. I, I, is, I that saying, an, is that an answer that comes around a lot? Oh yeah. I think, I, I can't remember who I was just chatting with. If it was on Liam's episode last week or the episode before. And I was like, I'm pretty sure Ben Harold, if we were to do a statistical analysis of the, you know, who answers who for that question, cause we've been asking that question since the beginning of the show, I really should go back and re-listen and find out who says who. But I'm pretty sure Ben Harold probably has a 50% or above average of like the most inspiring player to to the number of pros we've had on. So, yeah. you know, props to Ben. We'll we'll get him on here one day, and I want to know his answer. <laughs> but, yeah, dude. Cool. Hey, well, Matt, um, we're going to dive in here right away. Before we do, I want to remind those of you in the chat as well. Uh, this is a live conversation. There's two ways for you to contribute. One, drop those comments down below. Let us know you're here. And two, drop a question down in the Q&A tool. That's that little question box in there. And we will hit those questions about halfway through the episode and at the end, we'll, we'll run through a bunch of those. Uh, but that said, Matt, you ready to dive into the review? Let's get at it, buddy. I love it. I, I've told this story a million times, so I'm excited to see what questions you have, yeah. you know, to come let's, at it. Let's start actually at a different place, though. I, I want to know, you know, before Kendama, you know, who was Matt Sweets? <sighs> Before Kendama, who yeah. was Matt Sweets? Matt Sweets was just a college student, you know? I was what were you Jake, taking? I was Jake Fisher, essentially. Um, I was in a <laughs> frat. I was the president of a fraternity. And um, I, was, I took mass communications. So I took whatever I wanted, you know? In communications, you have the freedom to take just about anything. And yeah. I really dislike science and math. So I got through college with, like, one science and math credit each. And the rest were, like, electives you know a lot of writing classes and a lot of uh english and cinema and you know i did a lot of like actually in studio work you know doing a lot of video producing and um you know i i had a lot of things i wanted to do i was a drummer like my whole life that was oh, what, no that that was what my goal going to college was like i was gonna go for english or whatever but i was trying to get on the jazz team like or jazz team <laughs> the jazz uh band because i was a jazz drummer and was like state and yeah. my small town and whatever and i thought i could do it and you know i got to school and there were a lot better drummers than me from a lot different places and so shifted from drums to just kind of enjoying myself and learning things in school and kendama didn't come around until like you know, junior year, almost senior year of college. So I was kind of your average college kid, to be honest, you know, I was drinking mm -hmm. with my friends and going to fraternity parties and, you know, 
doing mm-hmm. doing the whole nine while still trying to get good grades and yeah uh, um were, yeah you, I, were you in minnesota taking school or where did you yeah go? yep i went to the university of minnesota so cool. golden gophers and uh, <laughs> i have my dad to thank for that i didn't want to go to college like i didn't have any i didn't what, like school it wasn't what did you want to do i've done I just not that I wanted to go work. <laughs> I just wanted to go work and make money so I could go do whatever I wished, you know, yeah. but my dad knew that that wasn't a smart move. So he like <laughs> signed me up and applied and did all the stuff for me to get me in. And so I thank him always for that. And yeah. I wanted to quit many times because college is not easy, man. College no, is not. very difficult, especially if you're doing the social thing like I am. And then that's a big part of your college life. It's, it's even yeah. harder. And so, um, I have my dad to thank for pushing me through all that because it was definitely worth it on the other side of it because um, I ended up studying a lot of social media. Um, Twitter and all mm-hmm. those things were just starting in 2008 and nine yeah. as I was graduating. And I had accounts as they were born, you know, like we mm-hmm. had our Instagram account in 2009 or something or May of 2010 um, because that's just the way we were. I, I was reaching out to people in the very beginning. But my schooling that came before all the Kendama was like, hyper focus on social media at the end. And that's where I mm. was like, we could do this, you know, we could spread Kendama, I could find people and yeah. yeah. Wow, that's super cool. So you were in college for a few years before you even found Kendama, I'm curious. So you, you obviously have this entrepreneurial spirit about you. Did you try any other, other ventures uh, before you even went into Kendama? No, no, so I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. That was not a goal. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, that was never a goal of mine was to own my own business. You know, I grew up in an entrepreneur family. So my mom and dad uh, bought a Dairy Queen when I was like 10 years old or something. What? Yeah, oh, my, mom, that's cool. my mom worked at Dairy Queen from when she was 14. And she just quit uh, two years ago. She, she worked in Dairy Queen for 40 years. And she owned a wow. business for half of that. And uh, so for most of my childhood, like I lived at Dairy Queen and grew up there and worked since I was like 10, 11, 12 at Dairy Queen. And so yeah. I was in business every day. My life was business. Yeah. I had no choice. My parents didn't hide stuff from us. They were very open about yeah. if we had or didn't have money and why that was. Yeah. And like I went and helped hand out coupons with my dad to like local, <laughs> local basketball places. Like yeah, he wow. really was teaching me guerrilla marketing and all these things that like you need to run a small business. You know, I was managing people when I was 15 years old, crews of people wow. older than me. And, you know, so like I did a lot of entrepreneur stuff through them and I kind of got burnt out like I was the rebel if you will of the family <laughs> like the the nicest rebel you could be but like if if my family's super straight laced I wanted to be like just I wanted to pierce my ears I wanted to have black clothes I wanted to wear yeah. t- you know I wanted to be not them you know and so that's like where a lot of that stuff came from you know yeah that's crazy so yeah I, I mean across a bunch of different social platforms and, and YouTube videos and stuff. I know a lot of us have, have heard a bit of your story, so we won't dwell too much on the early steps because because we, we've heard a little bit of that. But talk to me a little bit about your first point of Dama contact. You know, when when did Dama enter and what was that first couple months like? Yeah, well, it was literally like when I was at my cousin's house watching that video. He went down to his base when he came up and he had like the Chinese, you know, knockoff Disney version. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's not, it's not this, but it's this, right? Yeah. Like it's, and I was enamored, man. I, I didn't stop playing it the whole time I was at his house. And this is a cousin I didn't see a lot. I didn't hang out a lot with him. It was a long drive from college. And all I could remember is going home and just thinking about it. And then going on the internet the next day and being able to find zero information. Like couldn't find a picture of it. Couldn't yeah. find its name. Cause no one, they didn't know. No one knew no. anything about it. It was it, right? ball in a so, cup. That's what it yeah. was back then. That's all it was. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, man, that was like months before I ever actually like took it seriously. So I saw mm-hmm. my first Kendama seven, eight months before I ever decided to actually buy my own because I literally couldn't find it. It didn't hang out with that cousin. And so it was like the thing that hit me and then I loved it, but I literally had no way to get one or didn't even know its name. So I kind of just let it be, you know, until I saw him the next time. And then it was like this addiction where it was like, yeah. I have to find it. Like, I'm not going to stop searching the internet until I figure out what this is. And I like, I did mad research. And that's where like the business idea really came from, right? Is like, you I'm a 20, yeah, I'm a 21 year old who has way better things to do and way better things to spend my money on. But I am scouring the internet searching for this thing 
and I can't find it, you know? And so the light switch went on. Kendama USA was there, but they sold nothing. Like they didn't sell Kendamas. Their website existed, but I had come post their initial sale of JKAs in 2008. So Mm. 2009, when I was getting interested in it, there was nothing like- You came right in the gap. Yeah, there were gold Mugans, but they were not for sale, right? It was just like, and that's how it was for ever, dude. And I told people always that like, if Kusa would have had Damas, I probably wouldn't have started Sweets. I probably would have grinded to be on their pro team and never started my company because I didn't want to. Like my, I didn't want to start a Kendama company. That just came out of, necessity really because yeah you felt forced to do it because no one else was doing it and you just wanted to play with the toy so much that you're like well i might as well just figure out how to do this yeah when i was buying them for 25 dollars a piece from japan off ebay and they were 15 to 20 dollars shipping on each one oh, wow. so like i'm charging my friends 45 dollars, and i don't want to do that and yeah. i'm not making any money and more people now want them and all these things are adding up where i'm just like this isn't how I'm going to do this. You know, like if we're, if I'm going to do this, we have to like do it a different way. And that's when like we started searching the internet and that's when we found our manufacturer, you know, was like just, it was bred out of necessity, not out of like want to be the first Kendama company (laughs) ever. You know, it was like, like uh, someone should probably get these around here because they're (laughs) awesome and we need these in America, you know? So. Yeah. Did you, did you have that, like uh, that, you know, feeling where your parents had started a business and you were trying to rebel against them, you know, like, I don't want to walk in their footsteps and run a business and all that. Did you fight up against that in starting sweets? Yeah. Well, I fought against my dad wanting to help me every step of the way. Right. Like that's, it's more me dad thing than it is uh, rebelling. Cause like I want to prove to my dad that I can start my own business without him. And I can succeed right. just like he did without his help. When as a father, all he wants to do is help me because he's been yeah. through it already. He's done everything I'm about to do. And I'm essentially telling him to just F off because I don't want your help because I'm going to yeah. do it. And it, 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 he hated it. And he watched me fail for so long, dude. Like we failed so many times. It's, yeah. it's not even funny, you know, like it's pretty... It's pretty crazy we're still actually a business in here today because the trials and tribulations are too many to even get to, you know, to actually keep a business alive as long as we did. And Yeah. It, so, yeah. If, if you don't mind me, like, prying a little bit there, what were some of those challenges early on that you think that if you had let your dad stepped in that you would have been able to overcome earlier than later? It, it's mainly money stuff, you know? Like, it's it's loaning money or getting loans or doing your books right. Like, I can't mm. tell you how many people who are really smart and have owned businesses when I was starting told me, keep good books. If you manage your money correctly and you keep track of everything you sell perfectly, like your business won't fail. Like, but if you don't keep your eye on those things and you like make that the last thing you do, doesn't matter what you do to make your business or brand great, you're going to fail. And like, mm. that's something I didn't take to heart. And like, it, accounting was the last thing on my mind every single time and it's like the one piece of advice anyone in here who has your own business or is thinking about starting one accounting <laughs> is the most important thing because literally you can make as much money as you want the government gets a bunch of it no matter what and unless you can tell them how much they get you're in trouble like no matter what once it hits a certain threshold and we hit that way faster than i ever anticipated right mm-hmm. like that like like I said, this wasn't ever a goal. Like there were no goals. And so we just kept getting to points where I was like, "Uh, I need some help. I need help. Like, this is crazy because it's when you, when you make even over a hundred thousand dollars in a year, the government cares about you a lot. Like they, you know, they they want to get out of that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But when you're a hundred thousand dollars in a year is it's less than 10,000 a month. It's not a lot for a business per se if you're barely getting along, barely paying for stuff. But in the end of the year, if you made that much, the government wants their cut. And if you didn't think about that, your business that barely is surviving is now dead almost, you yeah. know, and we hit that wall a couple of times and only through, you know, money, like friends, family, different people floating us to get to different marks. You know, it's, 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 it's like, it looks so nice and pretty on the outside. Like that's for sure. You know what people see on Instagram and Facebook is so pretty and nice. Yeah. It's, it's like the biggest explosion of BS behind the scenes that you could ever imagine every single yeah. day to make it work. And 
it's crazy. So yeah, I would say yeah. like money, money stuff, regardless of if you have it is always an issue. So I feel um, that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I work for a startup and it's the same story, right? We, we struggle all the time with money and accounting and we have to make sure all that stuff is right. Is if you don't have that, right, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make it. Uh, and, and that's the hard truth. It's like, you can build a brand, you can build all that great stuff. But if you don't have that foundation underneath, it's not going to go well for you. And I I'm sitting here like stressing now. I'm like, I got this cafe Kidnama store online. <laughs> yeah. I got these other things like, Oh man, I'm going to have to get ready for taxis in 2021. <laughs> Man, you got to just have it in mind, you know, like yeah, I've never, have, yeah. Any accountants down in the chat, hit me up. <laughs> yeah. You know, the one thing about Sweets Kanama is that I've hired people to help me do what I'm not good at from yeah. day one. Right. Yeah talk, like, yeah. talk to me about that. Who are some of these people on your team that you lean on? Cause I think a lot of people think that you are the sole owner of Sweets Kanamas cause that's what we all see from the outside. But what I know is that, that that's not true. You have partners that you work yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. And it's by design. My, my partners don't want the limelight. They're not mm -hmm. people who want to be on social media and they don't want people to know their names. They don't have like, that is not how they fill their cup with Kendama stuff. You know, they, they produce some of the best Kendamas and they're the ones who are getting us into Target. And that's what makes them stoked, you know, because they're doing that for Kendama, right? Like mm -hmm. they don't want, they don't need or want the admiration because when Sweets Kendamas is on the shelves, that, that's all they want, you know, or need. So, mm -hmm. um, but I started the company, fun fact, I'm not going to go into it, but I started the company mm -hmm. with someone we actually had to buy out of the company two years into it. Um, so it was, uh, it was someone who was very explosive and helped me start it and had a lot of passion, but their work ethic just wasn't there. And so when we were starting to grow and change, they just weren't ready for that. And um, Gabe, came into my life gabe clem he's the mm -hmm. ceo of sweets kanamas a lot of people don't know that i'm not the ceo actually i'm the president i'm not even the the chief executive officer i gave that a title to gabe many years ago because that's not my job it's not what i do you know gabe is much better at uh, the business side of things and, and doing uh, all the professional side of stuff on that yeah. in that realm and that's what uh, a lot of ceos jobs and so um, Gabe's in charge, but he's the dude who came to my rescue. Essentially, um, I was, I, I needed some money to get sweets going and Gabe and me had become friends. And I talked to him every time I saw him and we worked together no matter where we were, I was talking about Kendama and for weeks and weeks and weeks, I just told him I needed $4,000, just $4,000. Just come on. I need it. I'll get you five. I'll get you 5,000 in a few months. Just help me out. You know, it's going to be great. It'll be we can do it, you know, just believe in me. I know this is going to yeah. work type stuff forever. And um, one day he said yes. And so uh, Gabe was in without knowing it. And so I spent his money and kept making kendamas. <laughs> and uh, he came by the shop one day and was like, so how's everything going? And I was pulling my hair out because of my business partner we kicked out wasn't doing anything. And I was painting from six to nine in the morning. And then I was stringing the rest of the afternoon. And then I was shipping orders and then I was doing emails and then the day would start over. And Gabe saw us a few days in a row and was like, um, I, you need some help or I'm never going to get my money back essentially. It's so what he mm -hmm. saw in his head. Right. And so Gabe literally started helping me. He started just coming to the house every day, even though he had a job and did other stuff. He, whenever he could, he just came and started working with me wow. and literally just helped me because that's all I needed, right? Like we had the idea. He saw the vision now because we had picked up. We had eight, five, eight orders a day on some days, which was insane back in the day, you know? Yeah, so that when was... you think about that, like for people, that sounds like such a small number, but in terms of the revenue dollar value of eight kendamas, when you think about that, that's not a small amount of money to make in a day as a small business. Yeah. Like no. that's when you know you're actually starting to do something. Yeah. Yeah. And we had wholesalers starting to reach out. There were local stores that wanted to carry our product and by hand painting everything, that's a very huge feat, you know? So it's like, uh, it, it, it's pretty crazy, you know? And uh, I saw in chat, this was 2011. This was 2011. Yeah. So we built our shed. We started in 2010, the website got up and in the summer of or the, the like spring of 2011, me and Joe Spitz started turning a, mowing shed into our paint factory yeah. in the back of this apartment. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've seen the pictures of that. It's insane. It's cr yeah, it's none of it makes sense. I don't know what I was thinking to be completely honest, but like I had nothing else like that was my vision. Like I was yeah. going to paint kendamas better than anyone else in the world. And they were going to be different and unique. And the whole idea was to do stuff that no one else was doing. Like kendama in Japan 
they were all solid colors, you know? There was, like, a couple people in mm -hmm. Europe doing a few things with stencils, and we were like, well, let's send it. And that's really, like, what Built Sweets in the beginning was. Mm -hmm. We were different. Even though it chipped, even though it wasn't the best, like, clear coats yet, it still mm -hmm. was something that you could be proud of and be stoked on for, mm -hmm. you know, a while. Yeah. Okay, just to backtrack a little bit. Um, so Gabe, Gabe is now the CEO. I am curious about the emotional, you know, choice that you you made there to pass off ownership of the company you started from the ground up. I don't imagine that's an easy decision for anyone to make. If you've built something, you were the CEO, the founder, the president. You had every title imaginable over that company, and then you had this guy come in who really, you know, came in and, and saved you a lot, did a lot of work with you to help you build that company, and you said okay, this is actually the CEO here. How was that for you to pass that off? Um, it was harder in the beginning, right? Like it was, it was way harder in the beginning. That's for sure. Just because I did everything. Like I shipped, I, I did yeah. literally everything. So giving those things away was more difficult than it got easier as time went because you do just feel so attachment. And I felt so, mm -hmm. I felt, many attachments as we went along mm -hmm. stopping painting everything in the united states for the first time mm -hmm. huge struggle for me you know to do very very difficult thing for me to to wrap my head around is not doing everything in house you know and like different different milestones like that are are more difficult than like a title right because in the end of the day my name is on the box like I am sweet, mm -hmm. you know, at this point. And even back then, that was my name for many years before I became Sweets Kendamas. So when my name's on that box, I see it as a straight reflection of like my my company is who I am. And so whether mm -hmm. whether I'm the CEO or not, I'm I have to make sure that everything's going yeah. good, you know. And so um Gabe is Gabe is just uh he is the yin to my yang. You know what I mean? There's no yeah. other way of putting it for every thought that I have he has like one that's in a completely different vein that is just as good of an idea right like it's uh it, it's very weird how we gel you know me and Gabe have had very little fights in our life like not mm -hmm. I can't even think of what they are if there were big ones you know and it's probably about when he's trying to convince me to do something that is a good idea and I'm telling <laughs> him no like to be completely honest like like Gabe's the reason we have tutorial videos like we do yeah. I didn't want to redo them. Like huh. I did them so many times. If you look on Sweets Insta or on Sweets YouTube, there's so many different variations of me doing tutorials. And it's because Gabe kept making me do them because we needed to update them and we had better equipment and we had all these different things. And so he's like, we need to just have more because we need to teach. And forever I was just like, yo, no, I'm done. Let's go film Kendama edits. Let's do this. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. And like fights came from that but it's because he knew he has this vision that he knows I'm going to be yeah. about once I get into it. But it's hard to convince me sometimes to do some things, you know, because I do feel so much ownership over, over stuff. It's, it is difficult. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I went, I went through business school and I like to always think of the question of like, what was the X factor for you guys in realizing like, what was the core pillar of sweets Kenomas that really set sweets apart from other companies? And even now today, because you were saying that you, you thought it was that you were doing everything in-house, painting your own kendamas and all that. But, but now you've, you've outsourced a little bit of that and you still do your cushioning and all that here in America. And, and you don't do the homegrowns anymore and all that. So what, what is the X factor that makes Sweets Kendamas Sweets Kendamas now, today? I mean, it's the clear coat, I would believe. Like the, even through all those other years you were talking about, clear coats is what we were always trying to perfect. You can see the frost that we had in 2013 mm -hmm. that was horrible, like literally the worst thing ever. But we, we, that flaked off of media. We had car paint that was so indestructible, you couldn't lighthouse it if you tried. <laughs> you know, we had so many things. We had ATAC. We, had, we, we were always trying to make yeah. this paint for the player, right? Like mm -hmm. we wanted to make paint that the best pros in the world wanted to play because it made them better. And we wanted to make kendamas for people that are just starting. We know they don't care about stickiness at all. And once we got that through our head, that we were making kendamas for two different people, our, our lives as kendama makers changed. And I think that's, again, a Gabe thing, man. He calls it the 99%. Yeah. I, I live in my own world of the 1%. So, like, you live in that world. 
the other 68 people watching this, we are the 1% of people who love yeah. Kendama more than most things in the world. Yeah, we're talking about weights and balancing and all that like nuance in Kendamas that someone who's just getting into Kendama doesn't even think about. They don't know what that means. They don't have a concept that that even yes, matters. Exactly. And so most, so in order to turn your company from a 1% Kendama company to the other 99, you have to have a product that hits that other market. And that's just mm -hmm. something that took me a long time to realize that Gabe saw clear as day from the beginning, you know, but I wanted to have this very high quality. I wanted it all to be made. I didn't trust the factories because they had burned us before. And there were so many different things that just were difficult to wrap my head around. But in the end of the day, it was about spreading Kendama love. I, how mm -hmm. can I say that like my motto since I started this is spread Kendama love. If I am going to only sell 200 kendamas a month how is that mm. doing any good to anybody if i am to only... people who already own you know 50 other kendamas right dude yeah we we create we have a lot of marketing we spend a lot of time and energy creating content right and if we use that content to only sell kendamas to this amount of people that that doesn't help grow our community and so that that change that x factor is when we decided that we're not just about 1%. We need yeah. to suffice the other 99 and make them part of our 1%, you know? And yeah. I think that's what changed the company for sure. So what did that actually look like practically though? So the mindset obviously shifted, but what were some of the steps that you actually implemented to target the 99%? Because now like when I think of Sweets Kendamas, I think of Sweets Kendamas as the entry point for so many people to come into Kendama. I'm thinking Boogie T, the Sweets Mob. I'm thinking of the advertising target, the accessibility. Sure. You guys have really done so much there that m have made Kendama an accessible game, sport, toy, you, whatever you want to call it. What, what were some of the strategic shifts you actually made practically to do that? I mean, the back end of efficiently getting products here from anywhere overseas that are to your specification are beyond insane. Like, like I, none of us went to school for international business, let alone <laughs> logistics and manufacturing, okay? Like, that's where, when I say none of us went to school for this or didn't intend on doing it, Let's think of what I'm doing now with my communications degree. I'm a full-time painter. I'm a stringer. I'm a shipper logistics person. I'm an international, you know, manufacturer. I'm also the marketing and social media. And like, <laughs> so like, there's no way that like the, anyone was going to be prepared for that. So all three of us are trying to just smash our heads together to figure out the best <laughs> thing. And it, it, it ended up with a lot of tr trips and a lot of traveling to overseas. Yeah. We, we went because we made kendamas in china and taiwan and i spent the better part of like 2014 15 and 16 over in those places like teaching them mm -hmm. how to make kendamas correctly in a like for lack of a better word because they were going off we've always been trying to progress the shape right and so jk was the standard and so trying to make something better than the jk was our first struggle how do we change this shape to make it better without changing it too much because we're still, mm -hmm. the JK is a huge part of our community at that time. And uh, the, the, the thought of having a Kendama that's bigger is blasphemy. And making cups that do things that make tricks easier are like, that's not mm -hmm. where Kendama was at that point, right? So it's trying to, co like, not copy, but it's trying to imitate one of the best Kendamas in the world in these factories that have really never made Kendamas before. And so there was a lot of many sleepless nights, like, just... <laughs> having them make sample after sample and changing yeah. thing after thing to try to like really make the kendama we want, you know, and that's, that's how it really happened because it's like, uh, and you, and you ask like, what did we want the beginner to get? And the answer was the price point. Our hardest mm. thing, the, the reason Kendama USA murdered us for a very long time is that their entry price point was $20 or so. And mm -hmm. our entry price point when we painted all our own damas until like 2015 was $35. It was yeah. almost never less than that. So it's, it's a very difficult decision for a new player who's not, who, you know, who's Googling kendamas. They see sweets, they see Kusa. Oh, I might as well just get Kusa. They're both reputable brands, but Kusa is $15 cheaper. It's a no brainer. It's yeah. legitimately a no brainer. And so that was our biggest struggle and where Gabe obviously saw the blockage where you know, we want to go to Toy Fair and we want to do these things. We want to compete with Kendama USA, but we don't even have the tools to do it. Even if we are the best brand or the biggest or like 
perceived to be, if we don't have enough kendamas to sell, that doesn't matter at all, right? To my other point about mm -hmm. you can have the best brand and biggest thing, but if you don't have the right logistics, you don't have the product to sell, it's it's all for naught, you know? And so figuring that yeah. line of command and what, what comes first is a problem we still deal with today. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's insane, you know? Wow, this is so cool. First off, this is like business 101 for everybody in the chat. <laughs> Shoot, I love man. this. No, this is literally one of the best conversations I think I could have ever had. I love this kind oh, of stuff so much. Cool, um, man. Oh, man, it's good stuff. Okay, so I, I am curious, though. You, you kind of hit on the, the competitive nature of Kendama. Looking at Kendama USA, you know, they, they were killing you at $15 or $20, $20 per Kendama. Did you ever feel like up against a wall? You know, as a as an entrepreneur, you know, maybe feeling less than adequate to be doing what you're doing. Did you ever come up up against that? Like, I don't know, I, what did they call it? like small man syndrome or whatever? You know, where you just like feel like, who am I to be doing what I'm doing right now? Yeah. So I never felt that way, but I always, I never thought I would catch them. Is the best mm. way of putting it. When they had Colin Sanders, bro. Like back in mm -hmm. the day, Colin was God. Colin was Kendama. He was the reason. He was the best. He was the coolest. He was everything about Kendama that was amazing, right? And Kendama yeah. USA had them. He, they had him. He, they had his videos, his videography. And then Jake becomes awesome. And Jake's there with their videography and their YouTube's just cruising. And I'm over here, I moving it up with my normal text, throwing <laughs> trick of the weeks on my Facebook, you know? But it was shameless to my like to whatever my credit or I wasn't like, I just wanted to interact with my fans. I didn't care how nice it looked because I couldn't, I had, I knew that wasn't how I was going to compete with them. So I wanted to just make sure we had our own base of people who wanted to interact with us. I kind of, I've never worried about the com the competition. I keep my eye on them and I know yeah. who they are, but it's, I'm more friends with them than I ever was yeah. competitors, like from the beginning, right? Like I was in the Kusa factory in 2011 or 12 in the first Dama Fest and talking with Jeremy and being like, we've called it co-opetition from the beginning. It's like, <laughs> we are, without one another, we can't all grow. Like it's not oh, one totally. company can do it, you know? So to fight against <laughs> one another is something we've never really thought about or worried about, you know? Yeah, well, we're, we're in like, what phase two maybe of Kendama growth and phase one is like hey just getting more awareness for the sport in general and if, if other companies are putting effort towards that that's just benefiting all the other companies all around it's not like it's not like we all already have 100 percent market share of the world's Kendama playing populations like we yeah. still there's so many people that need to be can evangelized to you know <laughs> yeah, introduced like to Kendama word. yeah uh, and it's like, yeah, the, the competition really isn't there at the moment. And maybe it will at one point later on in our, you know, Kendama history or growth trajectory. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll ask one more question. Let's hit some of these questions here. There's so many today. And so we'll try yeah. to hammer through some. Yeah, is there a time limit? I don't have a time limit uh, okay. in particular. But if you have a hard cutoff time, you let me know. Okay, I don't. I just didn't know if Instagram Live or what it did. I didn't know if there was like a time you usually do or what. Yeah, well, you know what? I'll brief, brief 30 second aside here. So when mm -hmm. we first started the review, IG Lives were capped out at an hour. And so it added this pressure to create these highly content infused conversations in less than 60 minutes. And so they were very quick paced, high energy, high intensity, just hit through the questions, get through them. And it was very filled with content. So some of the early episodes, it's like, all right, we got three minutes left and they're going to kick us off. Hit okay. this, this, this. And it added some pressure <laughs> at the end. Yeah. But then what, four weeks ago? No, this is like a couple months now ago, three or four months ago, they, they increased the time limit to four hours. Usually we don't go that, we've I've never gone that long. <laughs> Sure, sure. But but nonetheless, that's that's the history of the review. It's not quite oh, as cool. long or as as exciting as as the sweets history. But one no, day, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to Everyone's got to start somewhere, man. Exactly. Okay, so I, I am curious. Just before we jump into the questions here, what do you see as the biggest barrier now where you're at for growth for sweets kanamas? Um, the biggest barrier for growth always is new people accepting it into their world, like influencers is our way is boogie t proved edm people knew about kendamas for years for years my friends have been going austin have been going we've been going people in this chat have been going to festivals for years and no one it didn't catch on but it didn't it took one really cool edm artist to be on stage going whirlwind check 
and every person in the crowd wants to play Kendama, you know? And I mm -hmm. think it just goes to show like the power of marketing, but also like Kendama is how you are introduced to it. If you mm -hmm. are introduced it by someone who's showing you tightrope and showing you bangers and not teaching you anything, you're probably not going to want to learn Kendama, you know? And that's probably how a lot of EDM artists were introduced to it at first, right? And like, but to see someone they idolize at Big Cup, like starting and being stoked as ever, that's a very different vibe of seeing it for the very first time mm -hmm. or really thinking it's cool. Because really, that is the only way Kendama, in my opinion, grows to the point that we want it to be awesome is if it stays cool. And that is such a word that I hate to use because cool is in the eye of the beholder 100% in my mm -hmm. mind, right? But I love yo-yo. Are yo-yos cool? Are, you know what I mean? Like, are, I would say, like, if you're at school, yo-yoing, is it cool? It's maybe. And when I was in school, it was maybe. And, like, I think the goal is for us, we want Kendama to be cool. I want you to be able to be at the skate park playing Kendama and not have people make fun of you about it because your favorite skateboarder plays Kendama, you know? Mm -hmm. And your favorite dude that you look up to, he plays Kendama. And, like, we want that connotation with Kendama because regardless of what people think, we don't feel that way. We don't care if people don't like it, right? But I want the 13-year-old at the skate park yeah. to be stoked to pull out his kendama and jam it instead of being afraid that the kid doing the kickflip board slide is, mm -hmm. like, going to tell him he's lame. You know what I mean? And, like, yeah. that's, that's our ultimate goal is, like, I don't – cool is relative, but I want the kid who likes kendama to not get made fun of because he's playing it because the older kids think it's cool, too, because famous yeah. DJs and famous yes. skateboarders play it, right? Like, that's yeah. – that's the vibe. That's what we're trying to do with all this influencer strategy yeah. because the influencer I, marketing I, is powerful stuff. It is man, because we trust the people we like. Yeah. People yeah, listen to you. I'll buy whatever coffee you tell me, bro, because I trust you to get my coffee. knowledge. <laughs> let me, from, let me right? just pull up my affiliate links <laughs> and I'll send it your way. <laughs> Dude, I was watching your stuff before this and it was insane, bro. Like you're the, what you did to make your one cup of coffee is insane i couldn't i have never watched that process like and i was truly amazed like you you did everything to like grams and it's like whoa yeah. this dude is about coffee <laughs> like on a it's different fun, level man. yeah it's, it's so cool man but that's like to that like you don't have tons of followers but you still get my accreditation as a, a valued source of information and that's what mm -hmm. we all do with our instagrams and so mm -hmm. if your favorite whoever is playing kendama it, it, there's a much better yeah. chance that you have a higher respect for it. And that's like the goal. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to touch more on that after we, we kind of come back from this question break here. But one thing I wanted to, to, to touch on and kind of add an anecdote here to what you were saying, I, I used to work as a college recruiter and I'd travel around to high schools and high schools, conferences, you name it, and just, you know, try and in incentivize kids to come to my college. And I'd go there and there's all these stiffs that are dressed up in their fancy suits and stuff, like telling them why their school's the best. And, and I roll in in like t-shirts, a short, I'm wearing a condom around my neck, talking to these kids. I get kids coming up to me saying like, yo, that's that thing that Adam 22 plays with. That's so cool. <laughs> and, and that was when I was like, man, kids don't, kids, kids relate to that. Influencer marketing is so powerful in breaking down barriers. And it's like having those people in our community, Boogie T, Boo Johnson, Reed Stark, all those guys, literally validate kendama and gives you the ability to wear this around your neck without feeling like a total mongoloid i you you said it brother like you may not if people in chat you may or may not like adam 22 but you cannot discredit what he has done for yeah. kendama like there's no getting around like no rappers ever would have played <laughs> kendama you know what i mean yeah. let alone the most famous one. So it's really yeah. like, uh, you, you he, he's amazing for that. It's pretty insane. Yeah, it's crazy. Okay, let's yeah. let's take a couple minutes break here. Let's answer some questions. Uh, we got All a few right. from, from our Patreon subscribers here. Cool. Uh, and then we'll jump into the post questions. And then if we have some time, we'll hit through the ones in the live chat. So guys, put your questions on the post. That way they're written into my show notes. Yeah. Do, you, do you know how hard it is for me to not interact with chat? It's like a switch I know. that I had to turn off as I was like, about to talk to chat and I was like, oh wait, I'm not in charge of this. I'm just sitting here watching. I know, I try and monitor it just to see if I'm missing something every now yeah. and then. I've gotten pretty good at that. All right, um, question from Brett Walters, Boston W on Instagram. He says, hey Matt, uh, this is a funny question because I put it up All on right. my story. Says, I know hey, Boston. 
Yeah, he, he's a beauty. And and yeah. shout out Boston. He did an ad for you guys once upon a time last year for 28 Tricks, right? He had filmed a, a series of of like kind of like uh, short reels of the the V. I don't even remember what series it was. But he, anyways, I, I know if, if you're you don't jogging my it, memory, but I don't remember. Off the if you don't remember it, I think there's a blog on my website written by him that he talks about uh, that process on there and the videos and stuff. Go check it out afterwards. It's really cool okay. stuff. Cool. Um, Brett Walters asks, hey, Matt, how do you feel about Adam not washing his hair for seven months? For context, I had done the no shampoo thing for like the past seven months. and I just washed my hair yesterday for the first time. It's a ridiculous question, but have you ever done that? Have you done the no shampoo thing? No, when I had long hair, maybe like two weeks would be the longest I'd go without shampoo. Oh, but I yeah. have like, uh, yeah, so no. Do you have a routine? Everybody, for some reason, okay, you know what's weird about the Kanama community? They, yeah. There's this weird like obsession with knowing people's workout routines and the hair <laughs> routines and all these sorts of things. I get at literally, I, I swear on every show, someone brings up like, what's your hair care routine or skin care? It's like, it's oh ridiculous, my gosh. But, but what's your hair routine? So, I mean, I don't have it anymore, so I'm very free, you know? My hair routine most days is just like this now, you know? I just, <laughs> that's my hair routine. Um, no, I wash my hair with shampoo now that I have short hair. Um, when I had long hair, I did it every, like, week, you know, because it's so much work, and my hair is such a curly mess that it just sucks doing it. So, like, I don't know, but I think I'm going to keep cutting my hair. I'm going to cut it soon, actually, because I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to grow it out again. Like I grew yeah. it out last time when my daughter was born, Emma, and I'm going to have a new uh, kid in July. So maybe I'll start growing it again in July. Yeah. Um, but I have a question for you. What is the advantage of not shampooing your hair for seven months? <laughs> well, <laughs> A, you're saving a little bit of money, like pennies a month. <laughs> B, uh, it's just time that you're saving in the shower. You know, you're, if you're a hustler, you're like, Oh man, I got to get back to work. Got to grind yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. See, Every uh, the third piece there is is there's there's a lot of people that will say that your natural oils will clean your hair itself if you let them, mm -hmm. and but you're diluting your your hair's ability to clean itself if you're just washing your hair all the time with shampoo, mm -hmm. and so your natural oils are supposed to keep it clean. I I don't know if that's like how legitimate that is or not, but yeah. it makes me feel good about myself. <laughs> Well, can I ask you a personal question? How is the dandruff situation? Is it existent or is it like, yeah. that's what I would worry about. That's what I have. That's why I use my shampoo. It's like, take that under control. Yeah. So, if, well, we're getting into the vulnerability here. So I got, <laughs> I got, I got a real bad dandruff problem. And so most of the time I don't like wearing black shirts because it's like, oh, it's just gross. Yeah. Uh, and then, but anyways, it's supposed to actually help with your dandruff. Now I got like super, super thick hair and I wear a hat all day. So it doesn't get any sunlight. So it doesn't help my uh, dandruff problem. Got uh, you. You're not outside it's... like we were. When yeah, and well, and I'm in Canada too. It's like minus 30 degrees Celsius right now. Dude. With wind chill, it's minus 40, which is like what minus 30 something Fahrenheit. It's yeah, ridiculous. We're minus cool. 18 Fahrenheit today. Yeah, and it's like minus 30 some Fahrenheit. It's crazy. Yeah, it's bad. It's yeah. real bad. So, yeah. anyways, uh, long story short, it's supposed <laughs> to help with your your tantrum. I don't know. Anyways, oh, well, hey, I'm sorry for getting too personal, but I mean, <laughs> it's just like a. I figured that was like the reason. Like you're trying to get to your natural state, and then it yeah. wouldn't exist because. I have no idea. <laughs> well, that was the hope. But, you know, in all honesty, I'm actually growing out my hair right now. So hey, it's like, look at that. I'm looking like Christian Frazier right now, trying are, to catch up to him. Dude, when, when are you going to bun it up? Right here? Uh, well, I can. Uh, I could oh, do a top knot if I wanted. But the sides, the sides are kind of loose. So we're yeah. going to give it a couple more months, I think. Cool. All right. I like it. All right. We're moving on from your question, Brett. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, official D purchase. Danny purchase a longtime supporter of the show. What is something that can the Kanama community wouldn't immediately know about you? I feel like a lot of us know a lot about you because you're so public. Uh, but sure. what would what would be something we don't know about you? Yeah, yeah, I was um, I God, man, I'm trying to think I have a brother. I don't know how many people know that I have a younger brother who's named mm. Doug Jorgensen. He's 31. Does he play? Old. Does he play? Uh, Dama? Yeah, yeah, he jams. He jams. He's been to some events. He came to Japan actually to Kanama World Cup. He quali he's he's four hundred and eighty second in the world in the Kanama World Cup. So Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, he got a jersey and he was part of the squad one year. So so that was really cool. Um I uh I'm trying to think. I don't know. I was uh I can play every instrument just about. Like maybe that's mm. something people don't know. I am not really great at every instrument, but I could play a song on every instrument from like the flute mm. to the, you know, 
What is the most obscure instrument that you know how to play? The accordion. Whoa. Yeah. Do you like playing the accordion? uh, I, 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 uh, it's okay. (laughs) It's like, uh, it's fun because it's really hard for your brain because the bass is worked completely by buttons that are not like really, really in any way. Like they're kind of in order, but it's a lot of just memorizing where yeah. stuff is and then you're playing the piano on the other side while yeah. squeezing this sh- thing so my gr- my grandpa is like he he's very good at it and he's played it his whole life and he gets paid to play at nursing homes and he plays the songs of people's generation he's like 86 and so he always when i became musical he wanted to teach me and so i've had more than a couple in my day and yeah. i would say that's probably the most obscure for sure uh beauty what what's your go-to song to woo your wife and on oh. what instrument? <laughs> I mean, the the guitar, you know, and a little Oasis Classic. Wonderwall, Never Heard. <laughs> yes. You know, I, a little You're Blackbird. <laughs> yeah, a little Blackbird by the Beatles. The Her and Emma like that song. So, yeah. but the guitar is the one I pull out if I'm trying to make them all happy. Right on, right on. Okay, uh, one more question from the patrons here. We'll hit a couple more after this from the, the post. Uh, Chad Covington wants to know, who is the cribbage champ? He leaked me some deets that you... You actually are a, a more than average cribbage player. <laughs> Who'd you, did you say that was Chad? Chad, yeah. Yeah, so me and Chad got to hang out a couple of nights for Battle at the Border. And for some reason, I thought it was good after a whole day of streaming to try to teach Chad cribbage. <laughs> and like, we got through one hand and a half and that's as far as it got. Um, but I played, <laughs> here's something you didn't know. In fourth grade, uh, if you passed a math test, you were able to play cribbage instead of doing math homework on math day because my teacher was a G. And so I learned how to play cribbage in fourth grade uh, because of my math teacher, because I was good at adding. And so my mom and dad played. And so I played my whole life since I was in fourth grade. Do, do you want to know what my math teacher did to me? You, yeah. did, you, did you ever do, did you ever do mad minutes? Like it was like 30 math questions in 60 seconds you had to do. Do, yeah. you, do you remember doing these? Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, w- I was really good at these because my mom had basically created this like payment structure in our house that if we could beat her at a deck of flashcards time-wise, like going through them faster than she could, we get like five bucks. So I got really good at flashcards nice. and mad minutes were basically the same thing. You know, I was hustling my mom for, for dollar bills <laughs> and 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 my my teacher, I got so good at Mad Minutes that I'd finish it with like 30 seconds left to spare because it was just so memory focused for me. Yeah. She gave me two of them. She's like, no, you don't get to finish early. Just do another one in that. So I would get two pieces of paper and try and get through both of them in the minute. So like 60 Dang. math. It was more of whether or not I could write fast enough. That was what it was. Dang. So do you play cribbage? Uh, I used to. I don't really remember too well now, but I, I did really enjoy it when I played it. My parents were big into it. Like cribbage, yeah. rook, all that kind of, all those games. Yeah, I play all those old games. I love yeah. them. I love card games. We'll play sometime. But I am the champ. If anyone is asking or wants to bring the hands, I'll see you at NAKO sometime, hopefully, and we go, we'll play some cribbage. Awesome. Okay, let's hit a couple questions here. We got one from Alex Willius, or we all, I don't know how to pronounce his name. IG handles are so hard. Yeah, I know, I, dude. Trust he me. says, uh, what has been the best slash most successful decision Sweets has made to benefit their company? Examples being creating homegrown, starting MKO, Sweet Studio videos, Twitch streaming, Target, Cushion Clear, hiring a certain player. If you had to boil it down to like one decision, there's obviously thousands of them that you've made that have been beneficial, but what would be one that you'd highlight? Yeah, I mean, producing kendamas outside of america is what allowed me to be able to hire people and throw mkos and travel and send pros places and like without that significant change in our business we wouldn't be where we are but like people ask about homegrowns all the time by the way and like homegrown was one of the most difficult hard expensive projects i've ever worked on and it's the reason it's not just on the top of my list of things to do um, and I saw Austin said, Reed, a hundred percent Reed is Reed is the original influencer. Like Reed mm-hmm. got a model when no one thought a dude who never had played Kendama should have a model with his name on it. You right? changed, like, you changed the course of Kendama with that. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't even me, bro. It was like Reed and Gabe again, pushing at mm-hmm. me so hard. And like, I had to push the team because being a pro is a big deal and getting your name mm-hmm. on something is a big deal. And until this point, the only way you got that is by being like one of the best players in the world. And so we made a significant change in company culture to be like, yo, pros, this isn't mean that he is better than you or that he mm-hmm. is 
taking anything away. It is he is going to hopefully bring more people to our world so yeah. that they buy more of your pro. <laughs> you're promoted. You get more royalties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's like something that I didn't even see in the beginning. Right? It took me forever, yeah. but like, it, so, it, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. No, I, I just wanted to know how did that actually form? When did Reed come into the picture? How did that relationship actually happen? <laughs> I really wish like Reed was here to tell the the official story because I don't know like the I remember the day Reed showed up and I got to meet him and I got to fill his bike bag with kendamas before he went to Woodward. Like that's how yeah. I remember meeting Reed. And but he was friends with Bjorn, I think was like the oh. main tie. And he's Minneapolis he, based, right? Yeah, Reed's from Minneapolis. And so he was from here, but I think Bjorn was the tie. And then like I think Gabe of course, somehow had some weird like play in it for sure. Um, but yeah, I, re I just remember the day he came and like his energy was insane, right? Like it was just this dude of like ball of fire. And he had, um, he was like, he had so many things he was doing that it was like, mm -hmm. he's, he was about Kendama. Like, like that was the difference. You can, <laughs> Like, like Boogie T, all these people, it doesn't matter how much money they get paid. You can't pay someone to love Kendama. That is yeah. like impossible, everyone. So like these people who are on the team legitimately love it. And that's the only way it works is because without loving Kendama, you aren't just naturally going to show it and make it part of your life and stuff, you know? But Reed had that love and was like, this is the best and coolest thing ever. And so after that first time we sent him to Woodward, he came all the way at Woodward. And from there he went to like Estonia to some comp. And on yeah. the first like, you know, month of him being on our squad, he had given Kendama some of the more, most famous people I'd ever like thought they would get to, you know, famous bikers and skaters that he just was in contact with because of his world he was in, you know, he was at mm -hmm. the X games with Nigel Houston and all these people where, yeah. we would never have that in ever, you know, without Reed being the dude he is and being so, energetic and about just pushing yeah. this in front of people's faces and like he was laughed at for a yeah. really long time man like his yeah. story is probably just as good as mine because like he went everywhere and he was the kendama dude and not in a good way people yeah. were like oh there's read the kendama biker dude like uh you know and like mm -hmm. it took a while of him just being like f off dude this is yeah. way cooler and once dude. you finally get it you'll get it and like yeah he had that kendama person mentality of yeah. like i don't care what you think like and it took until like last year that the BMX community really like embraced us and embraced yeah. our culture because they thought of it as a yo-yo to quote my old yeah. reference, which I don't like to do because I like yo-yoers, but I just have no better comparison to make. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, just a quick moment of thanks to Reed and all that he's done for Kanama. Like Reed has put on, I, I was a BMXer and it gave me way more validity uh, when I, when I BMX to play Kanama Dang. as well. Nice. And so when I met Reed for the first time, I think it was MKO 18 that I met him for the first time. I was like, dude, this guy actually plays Kanama. This is so cool. He's not just a guy who was like paid to, to get me excited about Kanama. And you could just tell he was literally like riding his BMX around the sweet shop, like hanging yeah. out with people. Like, I don't think, okay. So like in almost any other world of professional athletes or influencers, it's like, if you're not a person of, of stature and noticeability, you can't just walk up to pros or influencers in a setting like that and like have a good conversation with them. But in Kendama, it's like, there's no barrier. We're all just here playing ball in a cup together. You can walk up to Nick Gallagher. You can walk up to Wyatt, right? You can walk up to, you know, whoever is there, Reed Stark, Boogie T and be their friend, chat with them, share this common love for yeah. Kendama. And that's totally different than anywhere else you go in the world. Yeah. And I think that's wild. Dude, it's, it's amazing. Like, yeah, I have friends around the world that I cannot speak their language. But if I flew into their country, I would have a place to stay and I would have yeah. homies to be with because of this thing, you know? And yeah. I'm specific because our, I have a little more reach, you know? But even when I was just starting Kendama in the beginning, traveling the world, like you're literally one DM away from most places in the world if you play Kendama and you're in the community, you know? There's someone who is yeah. willing to show you around the city at very least, which makes the world so so much smaller you yeah. know like going to hong kong and being able to have lee ho show you around is so much different than wandering the streets by yourself yeah. right it's it's such a different game and yeah. kendama is something cool that anyone in here if you are part of our kendama community it's worth a dm when we start traveling again to meet up with people because yeah. kendama people are the nicest and if they're introvert they just will not respond and not come out but chances are you're probably going to meet someone who's like <laughs> 
dope and fun and has a cool story and yeah it's, i'm i'm excited to do that again someday oh man me too i want to quickly shout out you know the dominards as well they interviewed uh reed on their podcast a couple like a month or two ago i think yeah yeah it's a really really good episode he dives into basically that whole story <laughs> of him going through the hardship of being laughed at by other people mm -hmm. uh go listen to the episode that that is some really great content with reed stark if you want to know a lot of what went into growing kingdom in the past several years uh, Reed is such a gem and one of the smartest guys that I've listened to talk on a podcast in a while too. It, yeah, it was ridiculous. He's, uh, it was crazy. Yeah, he's very smart, man. People don't know he works for us. Like he's legit yeah. an employee. Like he He, he runs our, what does he do for you now? Yeah, he runs all the display ads. So where if you see an ad on the internet somewhere, it's Reed's fault. And like he is the director and editor and like he is the chief officer of what do we call him? The, the senior director of advertising or something. I don't know, but that's his job now. And he does a great job at it, man. It's, it's cool. Cause the, cause again, you know, just like we can't go in person. So we got to reach new people some other way. And like the only way for a big company like ours is to, is to spend some money in the ad world to try to just mm -hmm. rent. Like we're trying to just reach out to different groups of people like snowboarders, skiers, people who love fishing, people who love whatever. We're just trying to get, to the people in those communities who want to do something fun and we're trying to reach them with cool ads that really grab mm. their attention because mm -hmm. i bet just like you they work sometimes like most of the times they don't but every now and then you see that ad and you click by you know so Dude, it's, it's actually crazy how powerful ads are <laughs> like working really working for is. an e-commerce company and like looking at our facebook ads it's like oh this guy like why do people click on these things and it's like they no. but they do I say the same thing too, but then one time it works when I'm on a website and something out of the corner of my eye is there. And I'm like, I was supposed to buy that three weeks ago and I did it. And then I go click it and it's like, it worked. Like, shoot, I, know, I can't I believe know. it worked. And then, but then I feel good about the money I'm spending on it. So like, it's, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> all right. We're, we're going to hit a couple more questions here. And then I want to jump back into that influencer conversation. I think there, there's a lot of fun there. And the reason I'm actually keenly interested in it is I run influencer marketing. Like that's what I do for our business. Oh, cool. Uh, it's super, super fun. I love it. I research it, listen to the podcast. I'm in chats with some of your the favorite brands and the directors there of their influencer marketing. Wow. And what you guys are doing is so fun. And I love looking at it from a business side, but also because I love Kendama so much that it's like, it's a mutual love of like, just wanting to dive into that conversation. But a yeah. uh, question here from Brett again, uh, what achievement are you most proud of with Sweets Kendama? Is the one where you get chills in your spine thinking about it. You're like, wow, that was the best. Target. Target. Yeah. Yeah. I could almost tear up, you know, when you ask that question, because it's like, from, Target's from Minnesota. It's a Minnesota-based company for those oh, no of you way. who don't know. So, know like, in our backyard is Target headquarters. And so, like, when we started, like, this company, every company in Minnesota, your goal is to, like, get to Target. Like, that is, as a retail shop, to get your thing in Target is, like, the win, you know, in Minnesota. And um, end of the nation. They have 1,800 stores. So, like, it's a it's a big, it's a big company, you know? But, like, that's one of those things that no matter how big we got, I never thought we would pull off just because we're the small company. You know, we're too small of a company. Duncan was in there. They're this big company. We'll never, they don't need two Kendamas, you know? And like, mm -hmm. they have this huge long relationship working with them. And so it was just this thing that as much as it was a goal, it was a goal I thought I would achieve 10 years from now, never two years ago, right? And so that's the one where, if everything ended tomorrow and I, you know, Kendama's, we quit, we stopped selling them tomorrow or something, that would be the thing I would look back on and be like, you know, at mm. least my product made it to the sh like shelves of Target. Like one of the biggest <laughs> corporation retail shops thought our product was good enough to sell yeah. in their store, you know? And that's like, and that's not just me. That's our whole, like our whole team, Cody Grizz, like that is their product on the shelf, not me, you know, like that mm -hmm. is all of us did that. Like, and and it's it's really through happenstance to be completely honest that i got the meeting to even get into target but like everything happens for a reason man and mm -hmm. i don't have that two yet, tattoo yet but i will because it's what's ran sweet skin damas is yeah everything happens for a reason and i believe people should live their lives that way man whether it's good or bad it was meant to happen and you can't change it so just move forward and try to make it better and try to learn from it and grow and like that's all you can do because getting angry mm -hmm. and mad and like you know frustrated or anxious about anything it's 
in the moment it may feel better, but it doesn't help. So to learn mm -hmm. from those mistakes and move forward and just, you know, know that it happened for a reason and that, you know, some good is coming. Yeah. If you just work through those hardships, I truly believe that that's like, that's what got me here. It's why we're still talking yeah. and I still have a company yeah. because I didn't stop when, you know, yeah. the worst things in the world seemed like they were going to stop me, you know? Yeah. You got to keep your chin up. Keep looking forward to where you're going. Don't, yep. don't let other people hold you back. All right. Let's quick fire through a couple of these. There's a couple okay. fun ones in there about, you know, gamma stuff like that. We'll fire through a few of them. Uh, yeah. Welcome to my life wants to know if you could take any player from any team, who would it be? Who would you poach, Matt? Bonds. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like Bonds is Bonds has been one of my best friends forever, and uh, he wouldn't ever be on the sweet squad. So the only way I would get him is if this theoretical thing happened. So yeah. Bonds, I would steal Bonds. He's an awesome guy. Right on. Uh, underscore Simon underscore Holt wants to know what is your favorite sweet stama of all time. <laughs> loaded question. It's way too loaded, brother. Way too loaded of a question. There's got to be one on here on this wall that I like. There is one on this wall. I just got to find it. No, I mean, okay. I, I could give you, I could give you 800 answers. Okay. How many dolmas have you guys actually released? First off, do you know the number? No, some, some fan may have to do that someday, but I have, I have no idea. I don't know how many Kanamas we've sold to date. Uh, you know, I, I, do you know how many designs number. though? No. No, wow. I, I like again. It's a bookkeeping was not a thing. I don't have one of every dama, you know. Because right. in the beginning, we had to sell sell damas to survive. So I wasn't stockpiling so them. No, like, you were just getting them out. No, Gabe and Paulson were like, "Yo, sweets, quit taking damas. Like, we need to sell these." It was the opposite. Like, because I was a player, like a hard player. So I was going through damas like <laughs> every other day. It seemed, you know. Yeah. So. I, I see Cody offering to do the math. So yeah, Cody, if yeah. you want to come back with us, uh, come back to us with a spreadsheet. Let us know. So this is one of my most like things I'm proud of is the collab with Kazuma Iwata. Um, yeah. He's never collabed with a company before. So it was really cool to be able to Mugen get his homegrown. original paint, his original Mugen paint, you know, with, with an yeah. updated clear on the homegrown is, is very dope. But um, any of the homegrowns we made, I'm super proud of all the homegrowns when that era was existing. Cause that's where we were really diving into paint tech and all yeah. this stuff. So, but yeah. like, there's not one I don't love. They're all my babies, right? Is the answer. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's, here's a potential one that you can say no answer to. Yeah. Uh, Dylan underscore Carney underscore wants to know, why did the Target Damas go on a huge discount? Are there new ones coming? Oh, so here's a fun fact about Target. We don't control discounts. We are not in charge of when and how any of that happens. It you just sell to them and then they choose. Yeah. So we, we they buy the products and so it's theirs. They get to do whatever they want with it. So... Um, so you got like, so if you see the discounts, shout it out, tell people because you're not hurting me if you're pocketing them because I've already got paid. So you, you swoop up those discounts if you can. Yeah. All right. Let's hit one more here. This one's actually not for you. It's for down in the chat for Mr. Cody Grizz, the man behind a lot of what's going on at Sweets on the socials. Uh, someone in the chat wants to know, Cody, what are you drinking? <laughs> Let us know and we'll get back to you. Um, but in the meantime, let's jump back into the conversation around influencer marketing and specifically what you've been doing more recently. You guys have really pushed Kendama into a whole new world through influencer marketing, through Boogie T, Reed, and all of this, all of these guys on what you're calling the Sweets Mob. And you just put out this incredibly epic video that was edited by Cooper Eddy, uh, put together by Cooper, from my understanding. And was George involved with that one as well? I, uh, I do not believe so. I think Unlimited Miles was all Cooper. Yeah. That was an incredible feat, first off, A, that you were able to pull together these guys that are top tier athletes or producers in their own fields and bring them into this collaborative, you know, video showcasing a mutual love and affection for Kendama. I, I lost it watching that movie. I felt so impacted by that. Uh, but talk to me about your strategy there. Who are some of the influencers that you have on your team, these, these people that we may or may not know about? Because I know you've done some collabs that a lot of people don't know about. One of my favorites being the one with Reese Wilson. I yeah. love Reese Wilson. Uh, big mountain bike fan over here. Uh, talk to me about some of these guys that you've worked with. Who are the names behind a lot of the influencer marketing? <laughs> Uh, I think we've mentioned him already, Reed Stark. Uh, so Reed, Reed Stark's other job yeah. at Sweets is being the Sweets Mob Manager. And so without Reed, those other people don't join the team. So it's Reed's job to bring these people in to our world and to pick them based on 
like being the right person, you know? And mm-hmm. so um, the sweet swap, the first people, obviously Boogie T is a pretty easy, easy, understandable send. Why would we get him? Why would we get him? Cause he's an ambassador of EDM music, you know? Um, but then also Boo Johnson, right? Mm-hmm. Boo Johnson is just this dude where him and Reed were just really big homies and Reed, Boo gets the vibe more than anybody. And he is not an active Kendama player. He's a passive Kendama player. So when he's at the skate shop hanging with the homies, he'll have it and play a little, you know, if he's at the beach, maybe he'll play a little, but he's not this grinder, you know, but the, but it's the validation that Boo brings. That's really cool. That like mm-hmm. he, he exemplifies cool to a lot of younger skateboarders. And, and so Kendama being part of his, you know, everyday carry type of situation is, is mm-hmm. really cool. And re- Boo had like never camped. And so like, that was like <laughs> one of his first times legit being in the woods. You, camping. you can and, tell like, from the shook. video. <laughs> yeah. He was shook for sure, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, well, I mean, keep rattling off a couple yeah, of these, yeah. but as, so, as you do, I want to know like, yeah, as you keep going through them, why that person, what, what value did they bring? Why did you choose them over another person in that community? What made them stand out? Yeah, yeah. Well, and and Boogie T is just his, we have personal interactions with a lot of these people that lead to this stuff. It's mm-hmm. not just like random DMs, you know, it's like a meeting of a person of a friend leads to somebody, you know, when I met Boogie for the first time, he hugged me six times, you know, like it was like I had known him my whole life. And so it was this very easy decision. It wasn't like yeah. a question. It's like, how can we get him to be on the team instead of like, is he the right guy? Right? Mm-hmm. It was, it was this immediate connection. And And same with Boo. He came to New York toy fair and kicked it with us in new york for a whole week and like he is a cool dude he's just like me and you you know like he's eight years younger than me so he's a young dude but he's very like mature and very cool and very down to earth and Mm -hmm. and that's what we're looking for is real people who really want to just make this part of their life you know and so boo uh, also with his he has more brand deals than any of the people we sponsor so like (laughs) he's uh, a big name big name yeah is he he just reaches a lot of people would he be the biggest name in terms of like reach that you have on your, your sweet mob? It's hard to, I don't know. Numbers wise, Instagram wise. Yes. But actual reach. I don't know. You know, like. Cause Reed's ha, ha, really widely connected. Yeah. But Boogie is who I'm thinking about with his music. Yeah. Music reaches beyond like millions of sports. Right. So I think yeah. it's just like, uh, it's hard to compare apples to oranges. Um, and in the video you saw, we have two new people that we announced mm-hmm. the squad officially, and that's Hobie Doan. And Hobie yeah. Doan is a BMX or a good friend of Reed's from a long time. And yeah. he's a, he's honed. Like, he is good <laughs> at Kendama. He likes grinding for the hard tricks in Kendama. So he's, like, the opposite of some of the other dudes where he wants – like, kind of like – he's like Boogie. He wants to do 28 tricks later. He wants to land yeah. the hard tricks, you know? And he does this type of BMX that Reed doesn't do. Reed is about big airs and – extreme stuff and big grinds and this dude is like the tail whipper down eight stairs and like he's like yeah so hobie is like just this other bmx part to read where he hits just this different spot in their world where like if you like freestyle or you like tech tricks you watch different people on insta yeah like so hobie is this other bmx person in that world because also reed does less bmx you know he does he has a real job that he has a lot of stuff to do so bmx is part of his life but we, he wants to have someone who he really likes a lot in BMX be mm-hmm. part of the squad. So Hobie is one of the newest dude. And then, I mean, a dude that I can't believe is on the team, to be completely honest, is David Gravette. Um, David Gravette is from Creature Skateboards. And I saw him on mm-hmm. Thrasher King of the Road. Um, and that's how I was introduced to him. King of the Road is, do you know about it? No, I'm not familiar with it. If you want to give me the, the quick Do you know right Thrasher? Now. Yep. Yeah, so they're the skateboard mag. And every year they throw this, like, they make a book of crazy stuff that each skateboard team gets in a van. They have to travel for, like, a week and do as many things in the book as possible to get as many points and win King of the Road. And Mm. in the first scene of the... of the... of the episode that David's on in the first day, this dude pees into a cup and drinks a full cup of his own (laughs) to, like, start the show. So David is, like... The star from the Wait, beginning David did of that? Creature. Yeah. Like, oh, that's disgusting. You so, let that guy he, on your team? <laughs> Dude, he is a team player. He got 50 <laughs> points for that, okay? Puts like, the team on his back. Yeah, 100%, dude. Every horrible thing, he did them. I think he has Thrasher tattooed under his eyebrow. I don't, <laughs> like, he has some crazy shit he did. But, like, that's how I know him. So I know him as this, like, famous TV yeah. skater dude who will, like, do anything in his <laughs> crazy and like when reed told me that he was like super down with kendama and was like about it and like 
his whole new thing is David does everything. So aside from being like a professional skateboarder, he now BMXs, he does motocross. He's yeah. a fisherman. He does all these things. And it's like this brand, right? David does everything. Yeah. And Kendama is a natural fit into that. And like, he loves it, you know? And he's, again, just one of those ambassadors that we're proud to have as part of the squad. Because yeah. if he goes anywhere and talks about Kendama, it's, it's only good, you know? So. Yeah, that's crazy. And then you've had a lot of other, I mean, like middle, smaller influencers that you've also collabed with and done some partners with. Uh, who who are some of the ones that maybe didn't pan out? If you want to touch on them. I, and one in particular that I think a lot of us probably remember or we've forgotten about is you did a collab with Roy Purdy. Uh, sure. back when Back when Roy was like huge and then he just yeah. went off the map. Talk, yeah, talk to me about that because I, I feel like that would have been like, whoa, we just did this big collab pumped out a ton of damas and then silence yeah yeah and that's that's called la for you buddy like that's literally <laughs> like we got la'd hard like this dude just decided to change his whole everything and no one could tell him different and uh it, it's all about managers with a guy like that to be com to be completely honest mm -hmm. everyone else i deal personally with in dms he's the only dude i had to deal with managers so like it was cool when Dude, it was oh. cool, but it went not cool very fast because we weren't talking with him very yeah. soon. It was it was a hundred percent managers involved, and so I feel that so much because so much of my day is on the on the phone with managers of of people that we're working with as influencers. And when I get to have a genuine conversation with an influencer, it's like you know it's going to work way better. You know that they actually care. They're not just doing this for money. It's it's beyond that. And it's like when you can form that relationship, that's a win. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I I we we won't deal with people with managers very much more it's it's just too much man and yeah. the pe when people have a manager they expect a lot of money is all i've learned it's yeah like, well because they got to pay their manager still, yeah and we're still a small company in case anyone didn't know out there we are still a small business considered like we are not a corporation who can afford to do whatever we want right so it's like the, like like i said boogie and these people are doing it because they love kendama not because mm -hmm. we pay them millions of dollars or you know, millions is silly but like it's it's not about money it's that it doesn't work that way and that's what's so cool about all this and mm -hmm. to, and you you probably wish you had that more in your job every day is yeah. being able to deal with genuine people every day it's, yeah man and and so we're adding people um you, you mentioned reese reese is a good friend of the squad um he mm -hmm. is definitely going to be part of the sweets mob um that's definitely a goal of ours we the original dama we made from him just had some uh copyright issues with a certain company oh, that's not good because we had a like a hey that's cool and then that's actually not cool you know after oh we made no him, so but it was such a cool kendama I, trust me yeah but i can tell you we are planning something else so hey, well, if, if you, you still like have Reese, some of those old ones just uh I met well they were, my part, address. <laughs> they were part of the vault or like the mystery so I'm not sure how many are left but I'll see if there's any lying around all right well I'll send well we'll DM after this yeah yeah but that's one that you guys should keep an eye out because he's the best mountain bike downhill mountain biker in the world he won the championship last year from mm -hmm. Scotland he's amazing and then um uh, the other person that you'll be seeing a lot about soon is Juicy Joker you've probably seen a lot yeah, about him he's in the here. chat too Oh, nice. Juicy, what up? Yeah, he's a local snowboarder here from Minneapolis. And so I've known him for a long time, actually. He played Dama back in the day and then grew up and became a snowboarder. And then we reconnected and I, we got some Damas to him and he just got addicted like he used to be. And he is an amazing snowboarder, dude. His, his, his tech and how, like, I don't know, snowboarding is just different than when I snowboarded. I was also almost a, a sponsored snoboarder back when I was younger as well. So oh, that's a so huge cool. part of my life. But he's part of the new age of crazy tech. And like, I, I love watching his Insta and he influences so many people. Like uh, there are a lot of coupon codes that get used, but Juicy Joker gets more coupon codes used than anyone else because he has such a reach to, to people. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. super cool. So maybe to kind of wrap up this conversation is who, yeah. who is someone you're looking, who, if you could, you know, name three people that you would dream to have on the Sweets team, like as authentic, you know, parts of it as a Sweets mob, influencers sure. that you'd love to have. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I mean, so like Jamie Foy is a skater that we've had on our radar forever and we've had a lot of interactions and never quite come through with. So that's a dude who I hope someday would be part of the squad because his Red Bull connection is enormous and he is oh. probably one of the biggest big rail skaters in the world and we think he's amazing. So Jamie would be a really cool person to add. Um, I would like to get an esports gamer on the squad to be completely yes. honest. Okay, which... I, I was going to ask if you were thinking <laughs> that. Oh, esports, yeah, let's go. Yeah. 
So, like, we've gotten Damas to Tifu, and, like, Boo Johnson's really good friends with him, and, like, there's that connection, but he's just not a dude. He doesn't need money, and he doesn't care enough yeah. about things. So, like, it's finding that right person, because gamers in the Twitch world are hyper-focused on gaming. And so, yeah. Kendama is meant to be a supplementary thing, but if you're literally online for 10 hours a day, and you're sleeping the rest, it's really hard for you to be yeah. an influencer of any other sort. So, like, I don't have anyone in mind. But, like, mm. I am putting out the feels always in that area. And then, like... Uh, How do you do it? Like, I'm asking because I'm trying to learn. But, yeah, yeah. But, like, what is your strategy when trying to get someone on your team there for uh, the sweet spot? Instagram DMs. And it's helped a lot having a blue check next to your name. Um, when, right. another, when a blue check person sees a blue check in the inbox, they don't not read it. It's just right. you don't right. get passed by. You get read. So, yeah. The, it, with the blue check it goes up but really it's just it's literally the oldest thing in the book it's not about what you know it's who you know um, yeah. and that has happened to me so many times it's not even funny and reed is again that point of connection for a lot yeah. of this where oh i know reed oh i've heard of reed oh you know and with boogie oh i know boogie like so there's so many different worlds where we have a one we're one step away where as long as you make that connection like Drew Tetz, you you may know him. He actually just one of my favorite bands reached out to Drew to get a Dama, and Drew put me in touch. So now I get to get a Kendama to one of my favorite bands yeah. ever because Instagram just someone commented, someone sent a DM. It's yeah. literally not like I wish Adam that I had this like cool formula I could give you a yeah. plan that I, I have, but like, it, but it, it doesn't work like that. People think it's like oh, you just no. like send their manager a DM. And they're like, oh, we pay you ten thousand dollars. You're gonna make twelve posts, and it's gonna be good. Yeah, it doesn't work yeah, like that. No, no, Cody just will on a random Tuesday at four in the afternoon be like, dude, you'll never guess who DM'd us today. And then yeah. that's where the conversation starts. And with all the custom dramas we do now, too, like you, we don't post everything we make. Um, Maroka, our designer, one, uh, he just celebrated six years with our company. He designs the V series. He does custom projects like 100, 200 at a time for Kendama clubs or small get togethers mm -hmm. or small EDM groups. And uh, he does that enough where those pop up and I don't even, I don't You're even like, know. I don't even know where we did that. No, but he's infiltrating all these small niche groups yeah. of people, you know, that are hopefully growing and buying kendamas. And, you know, it's, it's this evil plan to just like spread it slowly, dude, to get <laughs> enough people interested where like me and you love kendama, but it took us getting it put in our face. And I know that there are millions of people who have just not had it in front of their face. And that is yeah. my goal every day to put it in front of as many people's faces as possible. And it's why we Twitch so much now and all this yeah. stuff, man. It's cause like, I'm hoping someone from Twitch sees me every time who's never played and they go buy one. If they do yeah. that, that's a potential. They're going to buy 50 more Kandamas like you and me, you know, like yeah. you never know. So it's, it's yeah. So, so that's the crazy thing, right? In business, it's like you can you can track like okay, a, a purchase order is like fifty, let's say fifty dollars or whatever yeah. it is, you know, and that's like one purchase. But in Kendama, the crazy thing is, is like the lifetime value of a customer is not fifty dollars because if you buy one and you love it, how many how many of you in the chat know how many Kendamas you have? Because I bet you most of you don't even know that's how many you own. Definitely probably, double digits. Oh yeah, double digits. If not, you're probably getting close to that fifty mark or more than that. I've genuinely spent probably thousands of dollars on kendamas and it's it's kind of i don't know if that's <laughs> yeah. embarrassing i don't know no, I don't know not in this is. chat it's not not in this chat it's not <laughs> but 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 the lifetime value of a customer is so incredible and it's like when you think of that as a marketer you think of that as a business owner it is so much easier to reconcile giving away so many kendamas by yeah. putting forth so much advertising spend because if you can just get one person in that person's value to the business is more than just a one-time purchase. You might pay $50 to get their eyes to your brand and then get them in there and they might only spend $50. But after that, they're spending another 50 and another 50 and another 50 and they're engaged and they're adding value to our whole community. It's like, that's worth it from a yeah. business side. That's crazy. You got it. You, you got it, man. That's it. That's Dude, that, it's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what it all, it's what it's all about, man. I love I, giving away kendamas because I, I hope at very least, you know, even in Twitch, we give away kendama every wednesday you know or a few yeah i hope if someone wins two they're giving one to their friend right they're doing yeah. something good with that other one and that's yeah. what it's all about right <laughs> that is what it's all about okay so let, let's talk a little bit today i i don't i don't want to take too much of your time but i'm loving this right now there's so much value here 
Dude, uh, yeah, I have a, I have just a little bit longer, and then I got to go to lunch with the old Bam. Hey, we'll 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 make it happen. All right, Sounds let's hit good. a couple a uh, couple questions here about what's going on today. Sure. You run the well. Now, arguably, now Battle at the Border had a thousand eyes on it, but but prior to Battle at the Border on your Twitch stream, you've been running the largest scale Kanama events aside from maybe KWC, and you've mm -hmm. been doing that through MKO and now the Sweets Kanama's open and all of these other online competitions. And I see this as really one of the next evolutionary steps for the Kanama community is you know standardizing competition, getting more competition, so we can actually begin funneling people towards something that they can watch, getting more eyes on something. Uh, I'm curious, you know, how has that development gone on in your world? And, and why did you choose in the first place to start MKO? How did that mm. begin? So like competition is what got me interested in Kendama. It's why like I, I am competitive by nature. My goal was to be a pro, to win the biggest competitions, to get six done. Like I was fueled by Kendama motivation to be the best, right? And mm -hmm. so um, when, and I, as a company owner, did not want to throw my own event until I felt I could do it right. And so that's why we didn't start, we didn't throw the first MKO until 2013, I believe. And because, and by that time, Jeremy had thrown two Dama Fests. So I had seen someone else do it two different times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to throw an event. I thought like every company should throw their own event. In my opinion, when I started, that was like, everyone should throw their own event so they can have their own tricks and crown their own winner and, you know, be part of this community where we all throw events. And so mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to throw the Minnesota Kendama open. We're going to do this thing and I'm going to crown the champ. And, and the goal was to just throw the fairest competition possible, you know, no. And this is when sticky paint started to become a problem, right? Like we released our first <laughs> home grounds at the yeah. first MKO. And so shapes were changing. Paint was changing. For people who don't know this, the first MKO, the last eight players had to play with Ozura Kendamas fresh out of package. I don't know if so you know even that. if even if they played with another Kendama throughout the rest of the bracket, they had to swap. You made them do that. Oh, what yeah. kind of monster are you? <laughs> <laughs> so the monster I was was one that was so worried about people cheating because we had paint that people could like do this too, right? Like in the ball <laughs> yeah. stuck. And like, there was all these things where people were trying to cheat. And so I was like, no, like we're not cheating. And here's how we're not going to cheat. Here's a brand new Kendama. Good luck. Have fun. Yeah. And we did that two years in a row. And I didn't do it the third year because on the second year, Sam Cannon took his out of the package on the stage of MOA and just started beating it on the stage. Like, for the minute I gave them to break in their kendama, he literally just messed the kendama because we all knew by that point, Ozuras did not work unless they were broken in really yeah. bad. And so yeah, you couldn't like, lunar on an Ozura that was fresh. No, like you, and so, you had to be Keith Matsumura level balanced to yes. be able to do that. And Sam was, and he was even like, he, and so it, and then when everyone saw him doing that, they started doing that. And <laughs> just it was just looking. eight people on stage messing this Dama up. And I'm just like, okay, this is obviously not, not solving the problem I wanted to solve anymore yeah. because it's not like, like I'm taking away people's, I want people to practice for two months and then I expect them for me to take away the thing they practice with for two months yeah. and still do it, which is, it's demented. It's a cool side game. It's not something that should be crowning the world's best player, in my yeah. opinion. So that's where that changed, you know? But, like, yeah. the MKO is just this thing, like, sweet, that's grown, you know? Yeah. And, and ebbed and flowed, and it's insane. And, and now today, like, I mean, aside from this year, last year at the last in-person NAKO, how many people showed up to that? Yeah, we had over, like, 500 and some odd people. You know, we sold... We, had, we sold 400 some odd hotel rooms for the three days wow. or something. Yeah. That's absolutely insane that over 500 people gathered to all play ball in a cup together in a hotel. And <laughs> when you, when you like put it in simple terms like that and the people that showed up like a guy like Reed Stark is there. Adam 22 is there. There's literally yeah, all yeah. these world worldwide celebs <laughs> all, all playing with a wooden ball in a cup in a hotel together. Like, and a, respect to that hotel for letting us do that and making a, an insane amount of noise all weekend yeah. long yeah yeah uh, 
but but it's crazy it's like that's the stuff that's going to elevate us to the next level is competitions right it's like we're getting really good at introducing people into kendama we're getting really good at the awareness of kendama and a lot of that like probably the significant majority the the vast majority of that comes down to what you've done with sweets kendamas with awareness influencer marketing all of that and now what we're trying to do is work on that, that side of the evolutionary cycle of Kanama of keeping people in and creating the systems for them to play a part of yeah. and to be in and to stay in and engage in. Because if all you do is introduce them and there isn't a, a system or a model for them to play a part in, it's really hard to keep them engaged. And You, and you hit the nail on the head, buddy. Dude, I, I've been <laughs> thinking about this nonstop for the yeah. past couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, how much time you got left here? Uh, I mean, I got like 15. Okay, I want to I want to pose a theory to you here in the last couple of minutes. I've been chatting with some people, some pros in the community, chatting with some other company owners uh, since Battle at the Border because I've had this this stewing thought in my head, and I want to run it by the guy who's been running competitions for the longest sure. of times. Mm -hmm. So, so right now we're in this we're in this phase, from my perception, in the Kanama community with events where we're getting really good at bringing people in, but we don't have any objectivity to say like any one player is the best player in the world. And we can say they've won this event and that event and this event, and we can probably all collectively subjectively say that, you know, Nick Gallagher is the best, you know, he's won sure. the most events, he's placed the highest in all of them, but there's so many variabilities to the different events. They don't play with the same tricks. They're in mm -hmm. different time zones, different people can attend them and all of that. But what you've been able to do more recently and what I really saw a ton of potential in was the Sweets Kanamas Open, the, the summer series, where you had, you know, four events, I think it was four? Yeah. Four events where it was the same sets of tricks and, and people could continue to compete in them and show up and win matches and lose matches, but it was all under the same setting. Mm -hmm. Now, before I give you my theory, I'm curious to know, do you have something in mind or in, in the works where you're thinking of a a more standardized Kendama ranking system to actually determine more statistically who is the best player in the world? Um, so the, the fast and quick answer is no, I do not have enough time. Um, and that's the only reason, mm. dude, that it, no one's done it. No one has time or money to start and run an association because that's literally what you're talking about. The JKA yeah. is a nonprofit run by three people then that that's all they do like that is their full job they they govern everything and like other people just exist in it and so mm -hmm. the hard part is is that everyone wants like us and kusa and Kram to come yeah. together and create this association no be this, i don't think i don't think that's the the answer no, no it, well, it's it's impossible is like because yeah. it's been tried to be done like glow can try to get us all together we've tried to work together we all want the same thing but no one has the time resources mm -hmm time or resources to pull it off together or separately so yeah. it's it's going to take someone like you with lots of money and a lawyer to figure out how to start an association and how to come at every company and propose to us yeah. how we be part of this association because without that i'm going to keep doing things my way as long mm -hmm. as i think that they are giving people a chance to succeed mm -hmm. and to grow and you know we're going to mm -hmm. work with the kendama institute very hard but like mm -hmm to bring other people into that world and to be the person who creates the standard yeah. is something that I'm not interested in really because oh, yeah. of what I've seen it do in Japan and the JKA, like you try to create standards, then people just want to rebel against your standards. So for, you know, you can't be everything to everyone is mm -hmm. what my CFO says always to yeah, me. Totally. Because I want to be everything to everyone. And I want Swedes to be this Mecha Kendama monster that can do everything. But in the, in the, in the end of the mm -hmm. day, you know, we can't, it's, it's impossible. Totally. I you agree. Know? So we, we got to just work with Josh as best we can to yeah. like do things in our own world and hope people like soul and other people want to like latch on and do things mm -hmm. the same way so that like it is more standardized. Yeah. So, so here, let me post a theory to you. And, and now this is all hypothetical in a perfect world where we have the money or a person like myself with the drive and the money and the lawyers to make this happen. And yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this as a system that would enable that sort of progression. Because I think if we can figure out how to do competitions to the right level and degree of standardization, that's actually going to accelerate us into the next evolutionary phase of Kendama, where people see their, their role and participation and they can uh, begin to achieve a higher ranking. 
I look across the world right now and I see esports as a growing industry and I see the, the foundational system in there that people participate in called MMR, right? The matchmaking rating or ELO based rating systems where mm -hmm. people are competing against each other. And if you win a match, you go up in rating. If you lose a match, you go down. And that margin or growth or loss is dependent on the two individuals' MMR ratings, right? Sure. So like a League of Legends match. If I win yep. against someone's totally challenger, I'm going to go up. So how do, how do we implement something like that into Kanala? Because that's a really attractive system to people because now all of a sudden I got a rating system that I get to participate in and I get to climb it and see my score go up. That's really exciting from a competitive standpoint. Yeah, that's my business partner, Gabe, compares Kendama to golf constantly. It is yeah. his favorite thing in the world to do. And you're talking about handicapping. That's all you're talking about is like you give someone X points because they are more level. And so... so by you coming down, by you giving up X points means that it should make the match fair regardless of what tricks we pull based on, you, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, which is like, in theory, that's perfect, dude. But again, Kendama is subjective yeah. a little bit because unless you're going to make the best players in the world take tests, the only way you're going to get to actually figure out who's the best is by competitions, like literal, totally. like first, second or third place, you know? So it's... yeah. So, so here, hear this out. Yeah, I got, I got a, I got a thought here. Theory. All right. So, if we run, let's say that I'll, I'll, I'll own it for a second. This is, I, okay. I'll say I'll run it. So that way, okay, I'm not okay, putting cool. the pressure on any company. Yeah. Let's say I run a, a league, and it's a year long season, and and in that season, there's a hundred tricks per se, and there's twelve events or eleven events in a championship at the end of the year. In that, it's a pro pro competition. You know, there might be one registration fee at the beginning of the season. It's hosted online for a specific region in the world, so that it's always standardized on the time that we compete. So it's not it's not forcing Japanese players to play at a specific time because that's a disadvantage for them. Yeah. So let's say we run it as a North American season, North American league, and maybe there's one in Japan. But let's ju let's just isolate North America gotcha. for a second. Yep. We run 11 comps throughout the year, 11, 11 events, and then the, the grand championship at the end. There's 100 tricks that are pooled together. You know, that, that whole system could be figured out. And we run 30, 32 players in each of these events or whatever the rating is. Now, you could run and then just place people on their position in the competition. You know, first, second, third, fourth, whatever, and they get certain points. However, that is so dependent on the first rounds of the brackets, right? You know, if, if I lose up against someone who's really, really good in the first round and I get knocked out, that, that's not a great indicator of my skill or the points or anything like that based on ranking systems. So yeah. what I think is if we began that season with all these pros sitting at a 1500 MMR and then over the course of 11 events, as they win and lose to certain players, their rating system is going to go up and down, not based on placement, but based on the matches won and matches lost against certain players. So you may only place 17th in a tournament, but you're actually still going up in rating and your score is still going up. And then what you do is at the end of the season, you take the top 32 players, essentially, that have the highest MMR, which isn't necessarily the people that win it or lose it, or the first, second, thirds of these different brackets or tournaments, but the people that have won the most consistent matches throughout the entire season are now yeah. placed in a grand championship at the end where there's that 100 trick pooling all to be drawn from. And so throughout the season, you know, maybe you have those 11 events and only 30 tricks are pulled from each event to be used, but it's from that same pooling of 100, so there's a standardization there. Thoughts? I think it sounds cool. I think it sounds cool. I think that <clears throat> it's, it's tough to think about doing an event every month in general, just from a guy who's done it already. Mm -hmm. Like, is there, would people tune in most likely? Will you get pros every time? I don't think so. No. And that's like the, that's the hard part with where we're at, with all the stuff you're talking about is like, it is the next evolution, but I think we need more players still you, before okay. that evolution is, worth you spending your time and money because like mm. even with a cool competition system it's not going to get enough people interested in it to where right. like it changes our world i think our world needs to be changed by it being in more targets and walmarts and walgreens and places where it's this thing that everyone has and then we can throw competitions because it's not just 32 people who are really good in the world because if you want to really have a pro competition i have a list mm. that is made and it's like 50 people who can do the hardest tricks who are down to get on the internet and are in a time zone, right? Like, mm. so you're going to do all this yeah. work for 50 people, you know what right. I mean? Like, so, yeah. and if you want to do it for everyone, 
that's a way harder job, right? Like, yeah. And, and that's where the scalability, like your ideas are like spot on. Dude. They're not, they're not bad ideas. It's just the reality of pulling it off. And cause you need to make money. Like, mm -hmm. right. Like you can't do that for free. No one can do that for free. Someone mm -hmm. has to be able to make money that, that fee at the beginning of the year has to be substantial and it has to mm -hmm. be seemed deemed worthy in some way, shape or form. And like, that's where it's a sick idea, but to bring it to life would be like, we would talk all year this year to maybe do it next year. Right. Like that's yeah. the kind of planning. I think that something like that would happen because it's, it's a big feat, man. Like what we do to just pull off like battle at the border is weeks of work. Yeah. Right. And there's me, Cody, Brad and Josh. So there's four people minimum who take like, who have to take a whole day's work and more to just put on one little event. And so mm -hmm. Having to do that every month on top of all our other jobs, usually on a weekend, is like also something yeah. that's very difficult, even for us who love doing it and want to. Like, yeah. and we're the people who have, like, who know how to do yeah. it. But you know, there's there's so much that goes into it, man. I wish totally. I could just do it every day. I wish I could be on Twitch just hosting comps every day. <laughs> I would because I think it's great and it's what Kendama needs, you know. But I think we're yeah. not we're not there just yet. So yeah, I, I think, I think your ideas are good. I think you're right. I think we need to hit a scalability first of AIs. And I think the thing that ticked me off to it is like, we had a thousand people watching Battle at the Border. Now a thousand people tuning in and the amount of donos and everything that comes in is starting to make it seem more realistic to be able to pull something off like that and have someone potentially do a salary on just running that. If they're doing it, you know, once a month or whatever that looks like is we're getting closer. I don't think we're ready yet, but it's good to start thinking about it and asking, you know, how do we do it? And Dude, what would I mean, it look like? Yeah. Yeah. If you ask me, what we pull off on Twitch is pretty impressive. And I don't oh, yeah. like patting myself on the back ever, but Twitch is a pretty intense platform to like it is gain hard to followers on and like be official on. And like Cody Grizz is the only reason. He's pushed me for the last three yeah. years to do it. And that's the only reason we were able to succeed this last year was because the first two years of us doing suites online and just effing around in the studio trying to figure out how to make things work yeah. for years, you know, that this year when we were ready to when we saw COVID hit, we all our light bulbs were like, we had, yeah. the, it was figured out in one day because yeah. we knew what we needed to pull it off and we knew how to do it. I knew how Twitch worked. And so now we've yeah. introduced Kendama people to Twitch. And so now yeah. I can have a Friday night stream and a hundred people just come hang out and chat yeah. with me because Which is they're so not powerful. afraid of the platform. It's a fun, it's yeah, it's its own community, man. It's really yeah. It's really crazy. And it could grow Kendama just as big as any influencer. Like yeah. tw Twitch is its own world. Like if, yeah. if you, if you get one hosting from one of the, the top streamers that's happening to, to stream Fortnite at like 12 K viewers. And they're like, yo, what's this Kendama thing? Why don't we just go raid this channel for a second? You now have the potential of 10,000 fresh eyes, just like happening to stumble into our, our little microcosm of a sport. It it's like it's getting to the point where I'm having to like stop myself from streaming too much. Like I have to find where the sweet spot is for me doing it. Not to no pun intended, because yeah. I feel like I could do it every day at this point, and we'd have a hundred people watching. Yeah. But like, at what point does the opportunity cost not exist? And that's what we're yeah. trying to figure out. So we're adding Fridays. Fridays were fun, so we'll keep doing Wednesdays and Fridays, and maybe some more stuff. But I think it's a it's a cool platform and a really cool mm -hmm. like it's a separate community. It's its own mm -hmm. world, you know, and it's you're even more of a fan yeah. you're even more in this niche of a niche like it's i think it's yeah. cool man i love it oh well man thank you so much for jumping on here matt i know you got to get going here so let me let me just say a couple words of thanks yeah. uh, from the community to you through me let me say a huge thank you for the work that you've done in growing kendama to where it is i know that you have so much pressure under you because you're the biggest name in kendama and people always see you as the person that needs to be doing things because you have that platform that's not easy to hold and you steward that really well despite the amount of crap that people maybe throw around in the world that the people who are already doing all the things for us so mm -hmm. let me say thank you to you for for that Dude. uh secondly thank you for the work that you've done in bringing kendama into new places and giving us a place to call home uh, in this community. I think that that is so underrated in this community, how much that you've made it comfortable for us to walk around the streets with a ball and a cup hanging around our neck. And a lot of that due to, you know, your influencer marketing, a lot of that due to the work that you've done and by you actually setting a precedent that that's normal, that that's a symbol of this community that is so loving that we get to partake in. So let me say a, a third thank you for the humility, the, the drive, and the effort that you've been putting in for the past 12 years now, is it, into Sweet Skin Almas, 13 years? 
Uh, so Since we celebrated 10 years on August. So it was an official August. 10 years. Yep. So 10 years, 10 years of grinding for this game that is built on continuous improvement. And you have continually done that. You've showed us that it is about continuous improvement and not just in tricks, but in who we are, what we do, the businesses we operate and the choices that we make that you've been refining that, honing that in and asking the really hard questions throughout your journey to do that. That's huge. Thanks. It's, those are two kind of words, man. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, dude. It's, I do it for all you, honestly, every day. And I say that as honest as I possibly can, because you're the reason I want to make better kendamas and, and better paint and cooler designs and, and get it in, in different DJs hands on stages so we can all rise together, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cody, my producer, Cody's in the chat, making sure I tell you guys that we have the Kiki Kendama uh, Kiki couch open is like uh, this upcoming weekend. Mm -hmm. So you can still get in and, and compete in a Latvian competition if you want to get in on that. And this Wednesday office hours is going to be a doozy. So like if you've never been to office hours this Wednesday, we have a pretty big reveal. So I am excited to get everyone over there for office hours. One o'clock CST on Wednesday afternoon. Absolutely. Well, Matt, is there any last words you want to say to anyone out there, to the Brewview audience? We got a pretty faithful listenership on the podcast platform afterwards, our Patreons. Is there anything you'd like to say to, to the people listening in today from Sweets, from you to, to the Kanama community? Yeah, yeah. I mean, without the support of everyone, Sweets wouldn't be where we are today. Sweets was Soul Kendamas, was Lotus, was Quill at one point in our life, right? And without all of you standing behind us and being with us the whole way, we wouldn't be the sweets kendamas we are, you know? So I want to say that in first and foremost to all the fans that thank you very much for always having our back and buying all our new drops and just supporting us when we do different stuff. And, you know, we're, we just try to push kendama. So, so I want to say thanks to that. And then I'm just like, we talk so much about business. I want just everyone to, to like it's it's like the most cliche thing in the world but believe in your dreams and just mm. chase them because this was all a dream like literally everything i've achieved so far in kendama were dreams like i never thought i would travel in the world and i've been to 26 different countries because of kendama you know i've been to japan 15 times i've like I, I, I've I've been in boardrooms that I never thought I would be in and I've talked to people that I have no right talking to and I've and I've just seen and been places that my mind could never have imagined. It's only because I blindly chased what I truly believed in my heart was was the right thing to do, you know? And uh I I implore everyone, whether it's it's riding a skateboard or drawing or, you know, video games, whatever it is, jump in head first and like try to achieve your dream because it's totally possible and uh it just takes a lot of hard work and it takes some mm -hmm. uh, a lot of failing before you get there but just know that i am living proof it's possible because i am not special at all like i'm just a normal dude from a normal town who did dumb things just like you growing up so like i'm really not special i just saw opportunity and instead of instead of sitting back and letting someone else take that opportunity, I decided to grab it and run with it. And so go out there, grab your dream and run with it, everybody. The cliche Matt Sweets today being real with you. Absolutely. Well, guys, down in the chat, I'm sorry we didn't get around to all your questions today. There are still so many questions left unanswered. So make sure you head over to the Sweets office hours. Go ask You can ask me there, there always. Yeah. Or for next week for our interview with MJR Kendama, Michael reeves the owner of kendama depot the, uh, sign up for the patreon and make sure you get your questions in there ahead of time it's just five dollars a month you get all the behind the scenes access and your priority questions so go sign up there and come join us next week and make sure you follow sweets kendamas if you're not already but if you're not already do you even play <laughs> kendama that's <laughs> yeah. the real question thank you so oh, much man. matt for jumping Thanks on again, here Adam. Appreciate we really you, appreciate it and we will catch you soon Take all care. right see you later man